Good morning, church. Uh, you seem to be excited to be at church today. Are you? What a, what a great day. What a great day. Um, I probably shouldn't do this, but I want to give some shout outs because I'm just so excited about just a whole bunch of things. And I was looking around during worship and just kind of making a, a little list. It began in, as a mental list and then I turned it into an actual list. Um, I don't know if you uh, even knew who Joseph was when he came out up uh, to close worship. Uh, Joseph's a freshman at Oaks Bible College. He's home for Christmas. And I'm, I'm just thankful for Joseph. Joseph and all of our college students who are home for Christmas. <clears throat> we're, uh, we're glad that you're off following God's plan for your life, but we sure do love when you come home. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Santa and Miss Claus, who uh, of all the churches... They decided to worship at Harvest today, right? And uh, if you didn't get your picture or your family picture, your kids, however you want to do it, uh, I think they'll be available after service as well. We'll do pictures uh, for you. Uh, I told Julia after baptism, I said, it's not every week that you get to get baptized and then congratulated by Mr. and Ms. Claus. That was pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, I got to give a shout out. Uh, there was, there's so many things happening. So if I don't pick your ministry, just forgive me. But uh, I stopped by... Uh, this week uh, after adultish. Adultish was going on, and I, I stopped by. Uh, that's our young adult ministry, and they had 28 at young adults on, on uh, whatever night that was, Wednesday night. And uh, just, I just had to give a shout out because it's just exciting. And neither of these people will be happy that I call them out. But uh, it is so good to see Loretta here today and to see Ross here today. And uh, if you don't know their stories, you can go ask them, but they are cancer survivors. God is working in them, and uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, and this won't sound spiritual, but I promise you it was. I got to give a shout out to Julio for introducing me this week to the most amazing uh, barbacoa tacos in the city, and so... Um, <clears throat> If you would have had those tacos, you would, you would, it would have been a spiritual moment uh, for you. <clears throat> um, I want to tell you about something before we get into today's uh, message. Um, you might have noticed a lot of people wearing the I Have Decided uh, shirt that we give away uh, for baptism. We actually emailed um, everyone who got baptized in 2023 and asked them if they would wear their shirt uh, today. In fact, if you're wearing your shirt and you got baptized, or even if you're not, if you got baptized this year, would you stand up for just, just a second? They're not all in the room, but a bunch of them are. <laughs> <clears throat> so awesome, so awesome. Today was our 11th baptism service of the year. Um, if you don't know, when you're ready to get baptized, come tell us, one of our pastors, and we just schedule a baptism. We don't, we don't wait. We just do it. And so today was our 11th baptism uh, service, and our Juliet was our 29th person to, to make a decision to follow Jesus in 2023. And so we started something uh, out this door in this hallway right here. Uh, we now have, we're calling a baptism wall. And it says on the wall, I have decided. And we've asked all of the, the 29 that got baptized this year to stop by today and to put their name on the wall. Okay, so they've already started doing that. Uh, Julia, I took her back there earlier and she wrote her name on there. And a bunch of them have already done it. If you didn't, you can do it after service. Uh, but we just want to celebrate break, uh, life change, and that happens when you meet Jesus. And so um, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm believing that we'll double that number in 2024. Would anyone believe that with me? So, so exciting. Connected to that, I, I checked another number uh, just this morning. Every Sunday, in fact, we'll, it'll happen today, uh, we will give you an opportunity to ask Jesus into your life as your Lord and your Savior. And if you do that, we're going to tell you about a book that we'd love to give you. It's called Following Jesus. It has some next steps for you to, that'll help you uh, in your journey of following Christ. And so just for fun, Lisa and I, this morning we checked. Uh, we started this in March of this year, so not even the full year, but we've given 87 copies of of this away this year. Isn't that awesome? So that we, this year, we stopped um, counting 
uh, people who raise their hand to follow Jesus, okay? Now, that, that's kind of a first step for us, uh, but it's hard. It's hard, to, it's hard to, to count, honestly. And now we're counting following Jesus books, because that means not only did you lift your hand, but you walked out. You took a next step. And, and I'll just be honest, if you take that second step, this is step one, and this is step two. If you take second step, you're more likely to stay on the path. And then third step would be water baptism. If you take those, you're probably, you're probably a lifer, okay? We just have already figured that out. And so we just wanted to celebrate what God's doing at Harvest. Is that exciting to you? Okay. I hope so. I hope so. So, hey, Dream Teamers especially, I know our party is coming up this week. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be epic. It's going to be our best one ever. Um, but I thought of this as we were putting the baptism wall up. Um, in the various areas that you serve, I know you love what you do, but I also know there's weeks that are harder and weeks that are easier. And on the hard weeks, this is my advice to you, just take a stroll down that back hallway, walk past the baptism wall, read some names, and remember why you're doing what you're doing. That's literally why we're here as a church, okay? All right, ready for today's message? All right, we are in a series right now called Adore. Uh, it's a series all about worship. The word adore means to love and to respect someone deeply. That's what adore means. Um, this week, uh, right here on the front row, Liz and, and her son Thor and their little cute, adorable baby, Gracie, they stop by the church to, to visit us. And we love when they come and they visit us. And uh, we were just chatting and talking. And Lisa reached out and was kind of showing some love to baby Grace. And she looks at me and she says, oh, Jason, have you felt Gracie's sweater? It's so soft. And then she, she said this, she's so adorable. She's so adorable. That's, we use this word, adore, right? Like it's just, it's, a, it, it's an expression. Like it shows love. And, and the question we're trying to answer in this series is really, it's really simple. It's who or what do you adore? Who or what do you adore? Because who you adore is who you will worship. Because you're gonna express that love, which is worship, that's I, my, our definition during this series that worship is simply expressing your love. You can do it a lot of ways. You can do it through your words. You can sing, you can clap, you can bow, you can lift your hands, you can play an instrument. You can do all kinds of things as worship. But who you adore will receive your worship. By the way, that is the central message of next week's um, service on Christmas Eve. We're going to have, you're not going to want to miss it. We're going to have all our kids in here. They've been practicing. They're, they've got a great little program plan. I'll be preaching an illustrated message that'll talk about this idea that who you adore receives your worship. We're going to do a candlelight. Um, the part you really want to know about is um, that we're having donut holes next Sunday, okay? So we did cookies today. We're doing donut holes uh, next Sunday. I know now you're ready to come. Um, that's what we're talking about next week. What a perfect time to talk about worship as we approach the Christmas season, which by the way, I've been giving you updates along the way. This is mainly for the men because uh, you tend to forget these things. But as of today, eight days, okay? Eight days till Christmas. If you haven't started shopping Go home today and do it. Okay, get it done. Don't be that guy that your gift didn't make it in time because I have warned you and your wife will tell you. Pastor Jason warned you, okay? Worship is central to the Christmas story. Today, we're gonna look at the Christmas story in the Gospel of Luke in chapters one and two. And I just have to tell you right up front that oh, this is a little bit ambitious today to tackle such a large amount of scripture, but I think, I think we can do it. Do you think we can do it? Well, I think we can. If not, we'll just stop somewhere along the way and Holy Spirit will do what he wants to do, okay? Uh, let's do this. Let's pause. Let's pray. I'm inviting, I want, I want you to invite the Lord to talk to you personally today. When we open his word, he talks to all of us. There's a cohesive message for his church, but I believe that there's a message for you, for your family. Uh, and so one of the things we do is we just prioritize this moment by pausing and asking the Holy Spirit to illuminate his word in every one of our lives. So are you ready to pray that? Let's pray it. Jesus, we're so thankful for the Christmas season. We have so much to celebrate but this moment right now is so important to us that we wanted to pause and we want to make sure that we're ready, that we're ready to hear your voice today. Lord, speak to us today. 
all across this room. And while you talk to the group of us, will you talk to each and every one of us individually? In Jesus' name, we pray. And you said? Amen. Amen. I have a question for you. Do you have a favorite Christmas song? Do you have a, uh, just show me hands. Do you have a favorite Christmas song? Okay, I'm going to try something. I don't know how it's going to work, okay? But if you, if you help me, it's going to go really fun, okay? I have some gift cards that I want to give away today to three of my favorite places, the Paletta Bar, Chick-fil-A, and Starbucks, okay? I'm looking for three people. I don't want you to tell me your favorite Christmas song. I want you to sing a line from your favorite Christmas song. All right, Susie's ready. She's waiting. So Pastor Jace is coming to you now with the microphone. Come on, Susie. You're on the worship team. This is, this is easy. This yeah, is they easy. They can turn me off up there. They so can. Yeah. They can turn you off. Okay, just sing a line. Holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Give her a hand. Which one do you want? Paletta? All right, that, that's right. Uh, I saw Sandra's hand second. That's the second hand that I saw. She's back in that corner. Were, were you serious, Sandra? I called you out, so now you are. All right, hey, that was good. Y'all sounded awesome. She sounded awesome. You helped her. Is it okay that that's also my favorite song? And I yeah. told them that's my yeah. song. Yeah, but now it's a battle of who did it better. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Okay. All right. Oh, holy night. The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Give her a hand. Give her a hand. <laughs> Starbucks or Chick Fil A? Chick Fil A. Okay. The all right. Third one. It cannot be the same song. Is it the same song? No. It's a different song, Rose. Okay. Here, take this because it's the last one left. Okay, we're going to get a new song now, and for those of you that complained we didn't sing enough uh, Christmas songs during worship, now, now we're getting you, all right? All right, here we go. Are you passing the mic to Bill? That was sneaky. I like it. I like it. Will Bill sing for us? I don't think you. Okay, okay. I'm getting a gift card. Our favorite Christmas song? Yeah. <laughs> Feliz Navidad, dun 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 dun. Feliz Navidad, dun 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 dun. Something about tomatoes and potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Bill gets a gift card for sure, for sure, for sure. I right, give Bill a ham. <laughs> oh, oh, so much fun, so much fun. Uh, here's, here's the top five Christmas songs of 2023 according to Spotify, okay, in descending order. Number five is Santa uh, Tell Me by Ariana Grande. Number four, Jingle Bell Rock by Bobby Helms. Number three, Rocking Around the Christmas Tree by Brenda Lee. Number two, Last Christmas by Wham, okay. And then number one, are there any guesses? Mariah Carey. All I want for Christmas is for Mariah to stop singing Christmas songs. I'm teasing. <laughs> Mariah Carey, Mariah Carey. All right. Why are we talking about Christmas songs? The Gospel of Luke records what I believe are the original Christmas songs. In Luke 1 and 2, we read about Elizabeth and Mary and Zacharias and Simeon and the angel Gabriel and the angelic host, and all of them worship in song, okay, well, that's what we're going to look at today. These are the original Christmas songs, and as we look at these songs, we learn a lot about worship. The birth of Jesus is foretold in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. An angel by the name of Gabriel comes to Mary in Luke 1, 31, and there's, here's what the angel says. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David, and he will reign over Israel forever, and his kingdom will never 
ends. What an announcement. But as you probably know, because you know the Christmas story, there is a problem. Mary is a virgin. So according to the natural laws, uh, there's no way that she's going to be pregnant. But Gabriel has an answer in verse 35. The angel responds to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she, was con- but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. And I want you to pay attention to verse 37. For the word of God will never fail. I, I have to pause for just a moment Because every once in a while as I'm studying scripture, getting ready for a Sunday, uh, I'll be reading through a passage and it just seems like the Holy Spirit is highlighting a a word or a phrase or or, 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 or a verse. And and, and this happened this week as I reread the Christmas story when I came to this line, for the word of God will never fail. And I just sensed in my heart that the Holy Spirit wants to remind someone that's here today that the word of God will never fail fail. I don't know what you've been holding on to. I don't know what you've been believing for. I don't know if today is an exciting day or if it's a difficult day. I, I don't know, but I just sense that the Holy Spirit, this, this is what you are going to receive from today's message, is a reminder that the Word of God never fails. A few days go by when Mary goes to visit Zechariah and Elizabeth, and something happens. When Mary walks in, the child who is inside of Elizabeth, who, by the way, is John the Baptist, who had a very important task on his life. He was to prepare the way for the Lord. And and what happens is Mary walks in, and she has Jesus in her womb, and Elizabeth has John the Baptist in her womb, and Mary walks in, and the baby inside of Elizabeth jumps for joy. Let me show it to you. In uh, verse 42, Elizabeth (laughs) gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb, watch this, jumped for joy. Here's what I want to point out about the Christmas story today. Every person who encountered the Christmas story reacted to it with worship, okay? Everyone in the Christmas story who came in contact with Jesus and the Christmas story, their response, and we're talking about worship, was worship. And if we look at each one of them, each of their expressions of worship give us insight, kind of a unique angle that help us better understand worship today. So I want to start with Elizabeth. Elizabeth helps us see the joy in worship. She says to Mary, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Let me just tell you that joy is a significant part of worship. I don't know where certain churches have gotten this idea, but some have come to believe that worship has to be quiet. It has to be respectful. They get offended at things like clapping and shouting or or some even singing. But as we study the scripture, as we read the Bible, not just here, but all throughout the Bible, we find that this is far from the truth. And here in the Christmas story, we get a glimpse of the joy that fills our hearts as we worship. Now, here's the deal. In most parts of our lives, We get excited, we become joyful, and we are not afraid to get loud to express that joy, okay? I I did a little research, it might help you. I wanted to know the loudest stadiums in the world, okay? The loudest stadiums in the world. So here they are in descending order. The fifth loudest stadium in the world is the University of Tennessee, okay, the volunteers. Does there happen to be any Tennessee volunteer fans here today? This was your chance to shout. You missed your chance. Okay, fifth, fifth loudest stadium in the world. Number four, uh, we might have some of these, Lumen Field, where the Seattle Seahawks play. Is there any, is there any, I saw, I saw like you weren't sure if you could do that or not, okay? You're representing the fourth loudest stadium in the world, all right? All right, this one, 
I'm super nervous about. I just have to warn you that I'm super nervous. I'm going to move to this side of the stage today to tell you that the third loudest stadium in the world is Tiger Stadium, where LSU plays. I knew, I knew that was going to happen. I knew, I knew. I, I was, I was waiting on it. <clears throat> I was waiting on it. Number two, so all of, them, all of them have been in the United States so far. Number two is in Germany. It's Westfalia Stadium, where they, they play a different version of f- football, okay? They play a different version. That, that's in Germany. And then here's the number one. Number one loudest uh, stadium, according to my research, is Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City, where the Chiefs play, okay? Now, Pastor Jerry just got filled with the Holy Spirit back there. <clears throat> So here's the deal. Here's the deal. I found some interesting about this. They actually um, measured the decibel level. It's called the DBs for a specific game when the Chiefs played the Patriots in 2014. Okay, and and I just needed I just need to tell you this because um, our media team actually monitors the decibel level on Sundays during our worship, okay? And so they actually target between 85 and 90 dBs during our worship time, okay? And some of you think that's too loud, and some of you don't think it's loud enough, and, you know, I'll never make you happy, so whatever, right? But here's the deal. On uh, this game in 2014, Chiefs playing the Patriots, they measured the decibel level at 141 dBs, okay? That's like standing beside a jet as it takes off, okay? What's interesting to me is I've been to a lot of sporting events. Nobody ever walking out beside me was like, they were just too loud in there. They were just too loud. I mean, that hurt my ears. I can't believe they cheered that loud. But I will say that over the years that I have heard that a lot about church, okay? And so if you happen to be a Chiefs fan or a Patriots fan especially, or really any sports fan at all, let me just, this will be a public service announcement. I don't want to hear it, okay? That, there you go. I don't feel like that was pastoral at all. If you're offended, talk to Lisa. She'll fix it. We know how to get loud and express joy outside of the church. What we learn from Elizabeth and John the Baptist inside of her is that we should be filled with joy as we worship our Savior, Jesus. What we see in Scripture is that worship, expressing your love to God, involves your whole being. When we respond to God through worship, we respond mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. We respond in all of the ways as we express our worship. Psalm 47, verse 1 and 2 says this, Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. Here's my question for you today. How do you respond when you get excited about something. I'm talking about sports, but maybe there's another area of your life. How do you get ex- how do you express yourself when you get excited and you're filled with joy? What does that look like? And here's my challenge to you. Could you give God just a little bit better than that? <laughs> whatever whatever it is that gets you excited. Could you give God just a little bit better? He's not offended that you cheer for your sports team. He's not offended that you're cheering for your kids at their thing, at their performance. He's not offended that you're excited because you caught the biggest fish, way bigger than Derek's. He's not offended by that. I mean, there's, there's no, but can we give God just a little bit better than that? We have to keep moving through the Christmas story because there's so much to learn here. Um, Right after this, Mary responds with a song, okay? This is an original Christmas song. I'm not going to sing it to you. I'm going to tell you. You're welcome. I'm going to tell you what we learn from Mary first because I think it will stand out as we read her song. Mary helps us to express our trust in worship. Here's her song. Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he took notice of this lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. 
for the mighty one is holy. He's done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He's scattered the proud and haughty ones. He's brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things. He sent the rich away with empty hands. He's helped his servant Israel and remembered uh, to be merciful for he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary helps us express our trust in the Lord. Think of some of what she said in this song. Um, he took notice of me. I, res- I, I define that as I can trust him, right? He took notice. I can trust him. He's done good, great things for me. I can trust him. He shows mercy. I can trust him. His mighty heart, arm has done tremendous things. I can trust him. He scattered my enemies. I can trust him. He has helped me. I can trust him. He has kept his promise. I can trust him. One of the things I love about worship is that no matter what's happening in that moment of my life, and no matter what's happened in the moments leading up to that worship moment, is that as I worship, I can remember that God is faithful, and I'm reminded that I can trust him. So you might be here today and you might be sick. You can trust the Lord. You might be here today and you might be worried about something. You can trust the Lord. You might be here today and you might be discouraged. And I just want to remind you, you can trust the Lord. We prayed it over Juliet right before she got baptized that the Lord would mark her in a special way and that for the rest of her life, he's never going to leave her. The scripture says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm just, I want to remind you today that you can trust the Lord. Worship helps us express our trust of God. In the next set of verses, there's another baby that's born. This is Elizabeth and Zachariah's baby. Um, we, we didn't read it because we just don't have time for it today, but it's also in Luke chapter one. And what happens is an angel comes to the dad, to Zachariah, to tell him that they're gonna have a baby. But Zachariah doesn't believe it because Elizabeth and him are old. Let me just ask you a question. <coughs> have you ever doubted a promise that God has given you? In other words, God gives you a promise, you're, you're in prayer, you're in worship, you're at a service, the Holy Spirit speaks to you, he gives you a promise, and you rationalize why that promise can't happen. Has that ever happened to you? And here's Zachariah, and he's like, hey, that'd be cool to have a baby, but we are old. <laughs> we are beyond the physical ability to have a baby. If that's you today, You've ever doubted a promise of God? This part of the Christmas story is for you. Zechariah didn't believe, so the angel says, it's kind of, kind of a big, big punishment, but that, the, the angel says to Zechariah, um, you're not going to be able to talk, you're going to be mute until your son is born. So for nine months, he's not able to talk The baby is born. It's a boy. And tradition would say that that they name the boy after the father. So they come to say, is the baby's name Zechariah? But Zechariah remembers what the angel had instructed him. So he gets a tablet and he writes on the tablet, his name will be John. That's what the angel said. So verse 64, instantly, Zechariah, after nine months, could speak Again, and watch what he, instantly, he began praising God. He began expressing his love to the Lord. Now, I would guess that after nine months of not talking, he might have a lot to say. What do you think? And and I just, I tried to put myself in his shoes, okay? I think I'd be a little bit relieved that now I can talk again. I, I, I think that I'd be happy about it. But I also have to say I also probably would be a little bit frustrated. Anyone else? Nine months of not being able to talk. I I might not worship in my first words. I might say to God, I can't believe you did that to me. Right? This is a little revealing of how I'm wired, but it's okay. I might look at the Lord and say, how dare you? Right? Or I might just ask, why did you do that to me? I, I that was, that, was, that was a big punishment. I mean, I am old after all, right? But Zechariah, his first 
words. He begins to worship. In fact, he begins to prophesy verses 67 to 79. I want to draw your attention to one verse, verse 78, caught my attention. It says, because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. Zechariah helps us express God's mercy in our worship. I find it utterly amazing that in Zechariah's first words in nine months, he talks about the mercy of God. I think we make two big mistakes when it comes to God's mercy and to his grace. Those, those two are almost impossible to uh, differentiate between or to separate. I think these are the two mistakes that we make is number one, we either take advantage of it. In other words, we say, hey, God's merciful. I can do whatever I want, right? Or we take it for granted, right? And we just, we don't give it enough attention. We don't, we don't believe like, like in, the, in the bigness of the grace of God. Worship helps us put things in perspective. And as we do, we remember the grace and the mercy of God. I don't know who said this. I, don't, I remember hearing it years ago that mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. In case you're confused at Harvest, we believe that you are saved by grace. What that means is you're not able to do anything to earn salvation from God. We are saved when we put our hope and our trust or our belief in Christ. You don't do it by the good works, by the things that you do. You simply Believe, and the grace of God comes to you, and you are saved. Luke chapter 2 now. That's all been Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 2, the story continues. Now, Joseph and Mary are in Bethlehem. They're there because of a census that's been called. It's very crowded. You know this. They aren't able to find a place to stay, and so they end up in a barn, right? They end up in a, in a manger. But it's time for Jesus to be born so Mary gives birth. Scripture says that she wraps him in some strips of cloth and she lays him in a manger. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great, here it is again, joy to all the people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find the baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Verse 13, suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, of more angels, the armies of heaven. And what are they doing? They are worshiping, praising God. Here's what they say. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. Here's what we learn from the angels. The angels help us see the peace in worship. Maybe you need the peace of God Today, maybe there's something going on in your home, at your work, in your, in your life, in your marriage, and today you need the peace of God. I, I just encourage you to pay special attention to this announcement from the angels. I love this announcement, peace on earth. I don't know about you, but I look around our world, I look around our city, I read the top headlines, I did it this morning, I read the top headlines, and I thought, our world needs peace. The peace of God. Would you agree? And I come back to this part of the Christmas story, and I remember that because Jesus came into the world, there is a peace available to you and to me today that did not exist before Jesus came into the world. I've had so many times in my life where my heart was in turmoil, and I'll make space and time to worship and honestly, often in these times, we don't feel like worshiping. We've talked a little in this series about a sacrifice of worship, a sacrifice of praise. And in those moments when I don't feel like worshiping and my heart's in turmoil, if I can make space and time to worship almost every time, the outcome is that the peace of God comes into my heart at a time that doesn't make sense. Now notice this. Most often, the circumstance 
that's affecting my peace doesn't change. But I receive a peace to walk through the fire. I receive a peace to go through the, the turmoil. I receive a peace that strengthens me for the battle that I have to get through. Jesus has always had the ability to bring peace into these times in our lives. In Mark chapter 4, the disciples are in a boat with Jesus. And you might know this story, but what is Jesus doing? He is sleeping, right? Which, by the way, that's the epitome of peace, right? Jesus isn't worried. He's taking a nap. A storm moves in. In fact, the scripture calls it a furious squall. And the disciples are freaking out. So they wake Jesus up. They, they wake him up and they say, don't you care? Have you ever felt that way about Jesus in your life? Don't you care? Mark 4, 39, Jesus got up. He rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. And right then, the wind died down and it was completely calm. Can I just tell you today that Jesus can still do the same in your storm of your life? In the storm in your family, in the storm in your marriage, in the storm in your home, in the storm in your... I'm just telling you, this is, what, this is what the Christmas story is all about. And we learn about this from the angels and their worship. Go back to the shepherds, Luke chapter 2, verse 15. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds look at one another and they say this. I love it. They say, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and they found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about the child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and she thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. I was reading the Christmas story again. And as I read this part, I thought this. I thought, I like the shepherds. I like the shepherds. And, I, and I'll tell you why. They're doing their job. An angelic host shows up, announces Jesus' birth. The angels leave, and the shepherds look at one another, and they say, let's go. Right? Let me just tell you, in following Jesus, you need some people in your life that will look at you in those divine moments and go, let's go. Let's go. Let's chase after what God has promised us. Let's do this. Let's go for it. This is a God dream. Let's believe it. Let's pray. Let's, let's go for it. And that's what I just love. These shepherds are men of action. So they go. They find Jesus. And it says this, that they left praising God for all they had heard and seen. So here's what we learn from the shepherds. The shepherds help us gain confidence as we worship. We gain confidence in worship because it helps us to see things with our own eyes and hear things with our own ears. Often, Lisa and I are called uh, to, for, for advice on a particular situation. And from time to time, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll give advice if we, we, we feel like the Holy Spirit has, has given us insight for, for that. But, but quite often, quite often, I'll say, you know... I'm not trying to dodge this, but you don't need to hear from your pastor. You need to hear from God. I'll say, this is a big decision. I'll pray with you, but it's a lot of pressure because you're kind of asking me to make your decision. What you need is you need to hear from God. And so I'll often encourage you to get into the presence of God, to see for yourself what God is up to, and to hear for yourself what God is is saying for you and your family. And this is what I see in the shepherds, is that they said, we gotta go and we gotta see baby Jesus. We gotta hear for ourselves. Like, it's not enough to know about what's happening over there in the manger. I wanna be in the presence of my Savior. See, as we worship, God sets himself up in our praises, and it creates an opportunity for you to hear for yourself. It creates an opportunity for you to see for yourself what God is up to in your family. Worship gives us confidence because we hear for ourselves. We see for ourselves. Eight days later, the, Jesus is presented in the temple. There's a man there by the name of Simeon. And uh, Simeon had been told by God 
that he would not die until he saw the Savior, the Lord, the Messiah. Luke chapter 2, verse 27. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms. Here's more worship, more worship. And he praised God. Again, Simeon encounters Jesus, and his, his expression, his response is to worship. Simeon helps us not to give up in our worship. Simeon had held on to a promise for a long time, but he did not give up. I know that there are some of you in the room today who have held on to a promise of God for a long time. There's some of you who have believed for the salvation of your family, and you've held on to that promise for years, for some of you for decades. There's some of you that you've held on to a promise for a healing in your body, in your family, in a relationship, and you've held on to that. And, and I, I just want you, uh, I want to come to you along with Simeon today in the Christmas story, and I want to say, please don't give up. Please don't give up. What, what happens in worship is, is it builds our endurance. We get tired of holding on to a promise. We get tired of, of wondering, is God ever going to do what he said he was going to do? We, we begin to question, did God say this to me or did I make it up? And, and we, it becomes hard to hold on to that. And what happens in worship is that it builds our endurance. It helps us not to give up. We worship and we're reminded of the faithfulness of God. We're reminded that we can trust the Lord. We're reminded that we can hear his voice for ourselves. We're reminded not to give up. And I want to encourage those of you who have held on to a promise for a long time today, do not give up. There's one more person in the Christmas story. This is the last one. I told you it's a giant section of scripture, but you're, you're almost there. You're almost there. The last person in this is found in Luke chapter 2, verse 36. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter uh, of Phineal from the tribe of Asher. She was very old. Her husband died when they'd been married only seven years. And then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. So by the way, if you want to know what very old is, the Bible tells us 84, okay? <laughs> it's the Bible. She... I'm just trying to get in trouble with everyone today, just so you know. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night. Day and night. We sang this earlier. Do you remember? Day and night, night and day, let incense rise. Right? Here's Anna. Day and night, night and day. She stayed, and what is she doing? Worshiping, but it adds two things, with fasting and prayer. She came along. Just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, she sees baby Jesus. What does she do? She begins praising God. Anna teaches us about persistence in worship. Day and night, night and day, she's worshiping, she's praying, she's fasting. In other words, Anna has developed a habit of worship. She prays in the daytime, she prays at night. Okay? She prays every day, not just on Sundays. She fasts and she prays. Anna is persistent. Persistent. We learn about persistence in Anna's expression of worship. And then there's one more line in, the, in this story. I just want to, we're going to end with this one. One more line. It says this. She talked about the child. This is still Anna, her story. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. I want to end with this idea. I told you that in the beginning that every single person who encountered the Christmas story, they responded with worship. And in this final encounter with Anna, and I really think we could see this in every single character in the Christmas story, is that the natural byproduct when we see Jesus is three things. Three things. And this is why I hope happens to you and to I today and next Sunday as we come face to face with the Christmas story. When you encounter Jesus, number one, he changes us. He changes us. Just, just real quick, how many of you can look back at your life before you knew Jesus and you can assess your life now and you say, 
I am different than I used to be. Anyone? Anyone? Okay, this is a better question. How many of you knew your spouse before they knew Jesus, and now you know them after Jesus, and you can testify that they are different, right? That's, a, that's a, even a better question because it's one thing for you to know you're different. It's another for your wife or husband who lives with you to say, yeah, they were different. When we encounter Jesus, he changes us. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. that says, the old is gone and the new has come. You're a new creation. When you encounter Jesus, and in a few minutes, you're going to have a chance to do this. Maybe you're here today, and you don't know Jesus, or maybe you knew him, but you decided to walk away. And today, he's standing there with open arms. He's saying, come on back, come on back. It's okay. I love you. I'm just telling you, when you encounter Jesus, it changes you. Here's the second thing, is that when you encounter Jesus, we saw in every single person in the Christmas story, it results in worship. We worship him. Why don't you stand with me? I think you're going to need to get ready to worship. When you encounter Jesus, the natural byproduct is that you can't help but worship. As you remember what he's done for you, how he's changed you, how he's saved you, how he's helped you, how he's provided for you, how he's rescued you. How, I mean, all the, the, the expression, it's just, I can't, I can't help but, but worship. So we're going to do that in just a minute. And here's the last thing. This comes straight out of Anna's story. It says, she talked about the child to everyone. She talked about the child to everyone. Here's here's what happens when you encounter Jesus. You can't stop talking about Jesus. You can't stop talking about Jesus. One of the reasons I wanted all my 29 friends to wear their I Have Decided shirts is because if you know these people, you know that these are the people that can't stop talking about Jesus. They can't, I'm just telling you, if you're around any, any of them, they can't stop talking about Jesus. I'm just gonna pick on her because she's on the front row, but Kayla is one of those. I'm literally looking across the room as I'm saying this, and so many of our ladies are pointing Kayla out as I'm saying this, because that's her. She can't stop talking about Jesus. When you get excited about something, you talk about it. Am I right? Yeah. All right? You, you, you find a, a movie you like and you talk about it. You find a restaurant you like, you talk about it. You find a book you like, you talk about it. I'm just telling you, some of us, Christmas needs to remind us of our love for Jesus. Because some of us have stopped talking to everyone about Jesus. I said earlier, I said, we baptized 29 people. Do you think we can double that number in 2024? Can I tell you, uh, Kayla's saying triple it. Do I hear a quadruple? Do I hear a quadruple? Can I, t- can I tell you how that happens? It's, it's not that the worship team gets better. It's not that my preaching gets better. I mean, there's no hope for that anyway. It, it's, it's not giving out more food at food pantry. It's, it's not these things. It's really this simple It comes down to you telling your friends and your family what Jesus has done in your life. Can I tell you, um, it's not your responsibility to save people. It's your responsibility to tell people and then let the Holy Spirit to do what he's done in you in their life. How many of you would commit right now that in this Christmas season and even into the new year, that you will be a little more bold in telling people about Jesus. Would would anyone do that? Would you do that? Awesome. We're going to worship right now. Worship team's going to help us. I think you're going to have a pretty easy time worshiping after we've learned about worship. And I would love for you to think about these different expressions of worship that we see in the Christmas story. And I don't know which one you need most in your life, but just grab a hold of that. Then I'm going to come back at the end, and we're going to close in prayer. Worship team, come. Let's give God our best.